how you actually uh, should be thinking uh, or even writing the tests while you are writing the code. And I cannot uh, overemphasize how important that is, even though I know you, you are skeptical uh, about this. But what if you actually want to write tests? How do you test the hardest to test parts of your code? And this is what I'm going to cover in the next, next two lectures, essentially uh, testing techniques, how to get you out of trouble when you're testing. And uh, today we'll talk about test doubles. So what is uh, the purpose of test doubles? Let's look at the general structure of a, of a testing setup. So we have here two components in the, in the system that we're testing. Uh, one of them is the component that we're testing in the current test. Okay, so we call it the system under test. Uh, and it has the word system in there, but it may be the unit under test, the function, the method, the class, whatever. It's where your testing is focused. You want to assert uh, that this component works properly. However, you cannot run it in isolation. It needs a bunch of collaborators. And uh, those are also part, typically, of your system, but they are not currently the focus of your test. Uh, we call them the dependent on uh, components. If we didn't have dependent on components, life would be a lot easier because we could just run the function you want to test with many inputs as you need, and then you move on to the next function. The problem is that to run this, you need this dependent on components, which may be uh, quite big. So these are, by the way, these are uh, sometimes called collaborators. Together they form the text picture, okay? and. Uh, this is a very general pattern. It occurs a lot whether you're doing unit testing or system testing. So uh, in this little table I'm showing here that for different kinds of test granularity, the system under test, for example, for unit test may be a method. Well, you still depend on the constructor uh, to construct the object before you can call the method. So the constructor becomes uh, your dependent on components. But other methods may also need some helper methods. They also become dependent on components. Okay. As you move on, uh, move up to higher granularity tests, the component tests where you're actually targeting several methods or classes, uh, the bigger the system on the test, the more chances that there's going to be some collaborator that uh, needs to be there for the system to run. And uh, the situation becomes most difficult when you're doing integration tests. Because uh, in integration tests, typically, you will have to consider uh, other subsystems uh, or even external systems like uh, Google Authentication if your project uses Google Authentication or a database if your project uses databases. And by now, from what you've seen, uh, in even your simple, uh, relatively small semester project, you're going to have a lot of other dependencies. So those become your collaborators. How do you test when you have such collaborators? Uh, so first, why, why are collaborators an issue in, in tests? Um, well, for one thing, it's just extra stuff that you have to think about and extra stuff that could go wrong. So I like to call it uh, uh, too many moving parts in your, uh, in your system. You need to worry about uh, starting the collaborator, uh, stopping the collaborator, um, updating the collaborator as your, as your project changes. But even beyond that, uh, you may pay a cost every time you run the test because uh, it may actually be expensive to set up. So a database really has to start in a clean state for every test. Even as, as small as a unit test, it should start in a predictable state of the database. Database is a big uh, beast, okay? To completely wipe out the database and completely reinitialize it after every test, considering that the database is actually a separate process, maybe on your machine, maybe on another machine, that's actually expensive. So then, what people try to do is say, I'm going to save a little bit of the cost of this setup of my collaborator. I'm going to share the collaborator. But you have to be very careful. Because if the state of the collaborator is not guaranteed to be clean for a test, then the test execution will be affected by whatever test ran before. And this is actually extremely hard to debug. Because when you run your hundreds of unit tests, you'll see failures. When you go to debug and run only the failed test in isolation, it doesn't fail anymore. And you don't, it's not even easy to know which of the tens of tests that came before it uh, is the cause. So um, we generally try to avoid any dependencies between, between tests. Uh, third point, these collaborators 
more moving parts, more things to break. Okay? You will get test failures, not because your code is bad or even your test is bad, but because the collaborator has, has a problem. Okay? And that's not something you would like to, to worry about. Okay? Furthermore, if, the, if this collaborator is external, like you're actually making requests to the Google API for every unit test, that's going to cost you, in terms of time, a lot more than the unit test itself. So if the unit test would run in one millisecond, the whole thing is going to run in 50 milliseconds. And 50 milliseconds sounds like nothing. And it is nothing when you just start. But if your goal is to have a thousand tests, okay, 50 milliseconds adds up uh, pretty quickly. So we try to avoid it from the beginning. Now I'm going to show you three strategies for avoiding a collaborator, starting from, from the really no strategies to the very uh, expensive strategy. So first and foremost, you're trying to think hard, uh, how can I get rid of this collaborator? I want to test this method. How can I test this method in isolation of these collaborators? And this is why it's important to think about how you're going to test code when you write it. Because sometimes you can write it differently with the same functionality uh, to, enable to, test, uh, to enable you to test it more in isolation. Okay? So you're looking for this strategy one, avoiding the uh, collaborator. You're looking for independent units, or you know, tearing apart the dependencies of this uh, of this uh, units. Now, sometimes you can do this, and typically your utility functions are going to be, um, in terms of dependencies, they're not going to be depending on anything. Imagine that you have a um, a sorting routine that, for whatever reason, you decide you need to write a sorting. Routine. That doesn't have collaborators. All it needs is an array or whatever collection uh, for input, and uh, it's going to work uh, without worrying for collaborators. And you may have a few of these in your in your system, um, but sometimes you have to think about this. You have to uh, work a little bit hard at extracting them out of wherever they may be buried inside your code. So I'm going to show you an example that ties back to the Bargaton uh, demo that we did last last lecture. So remember in this demo, we wrote a little Python script that was invoking Git to grab uh, and save in the text file the log, the output of the Git log, and then we take that in and try to break it into independent commits and go within each commit and extract the bug number, the number of lines changed. Okay? So um, what would you say is the system under test in Bugaton and what is the collaborator? If you are testing Bugaton, what, what do you care to test, and what is something that's just a collaborator? It needs to be there for the Bugaton to run, but you don't really want to test it. Uh, Git is a collaborator? Yeah, Git is a collaborator. Okay, you don't care to test Git. You want to test your parsing logic, your splitting logic, your logic that invokes Git, all that, if you have bugs, but not in Git. And it's an expensive collaborator at that, because if parsing may take a fraction of a millisecond, invoking another process, a lot more expensive, okay? But you didn't think about testing, so you wrote the, your entire script in one function that goes get the git log, invokes git, so the collaborator, then uh, takes the log, splits it, parses it, and does the whole of its work. And in some way, it's perfectly fine. This is gonna be half a page of code, perhaps. You don't feel the need to break it just on the basis of its size. But if you start thinking about how you're gonna test this, and where the bugs may be, and what's the system under test, and what's the collaborator, you really want to actually separate out the collaborator. And this involves writing more code. I'm not gonna hide to you that if you do a test-driven development, you're gonna type more lines of code. But uh, in some way, the complexity of the code becomes more modularized, and easier to test, easier to think about. So testing forces you to split, uh, split your code and separate out the collaborator. Uh, I'm going to separate it out in this separate method, get git log, and this is the method that's actually involved with dealing with the collaborator. Everything else is uh, is, is our code. Furthermore, um, when you do this, kind of separating out the collaborators from the from the rest of the code, you end up with the top level method, your main or whatever it is at the top being kind of very simple, kind of a script, like do this, then this, then this, your, your big stages of your project. So 
get git log, uh, split the log, invoke this helper method, split the log, and then parse the log. Okay? And this thing, your top level of your of your code, becomes kind of hard to test because it touches everything. But it, it's also quite simple. Okay? If you take all, in fact, this one even has a loop there. You may want to take the loop off in its own helper function. And then there's not much to test in this function. So this is a theme that we'll see today in the next lecture is, yes, there's going to be some pieces of a code that glue that it's really hard to execute without touching everything, so it has a lot of collaborators, but the glue becomes not as uh, important to test. So it's hard to test, but it's not as important to test because unlikely to have bugs in there. Uh, what you want to separate is all of this code here that has, you know, uh, has your logic, conditionals, regular expressions, stuff like that, that you're going to get wrong. Okay? Um, so top level functions should look like uh, pseudocode. We're going to call them humble functions. Um, or they are typically called humble functions. Um, you isolate com complex functionality in functions that are easy to invoke. So split log, let's say that this is the, the trickiest part of our project. Well, it doesn't have any collaborator because it, uh, somebody will pass it the log as a big string. Okay? So it becomes almost like a sorting function. It gets its data and does its complex stuff and then returns. Very easy to test. And then parsing the message is a part of split log as well. Okay? Um, and dependencies ideally should be to the parameters. So you don't want split log to internally go and grab the log from somewhere because that becomes a collaborator then for split log. You want to pass it in to split log, put the responsibility on whoever calls split log to deal with the collaborators, get, gather the stuff, let split log worry about the, the actual computation. Any, any questions? Moving along then. Uh, Okay, so that's, that's method number one. Essentially, hoist out, try to make these independent units. And there's only so much you can do with that. Um, but at some point, you really want to test the code that you know, interacts with other components. So uh, there's, a, there's a second strategy that you can use there, and it's actually fairly, fairly common. Let's say that you have a module one as part of your system, and uh, it's, uh, it's at the bottom of the hierarchy in terms of dependency. It doesn't depend on other any other modules. Okay, this is a good uh, candidate for applying the previous strategy for kind of hoisting out independent units and testing independently. Okay, <coughs> uh, so essentially avoid the collaborator. Uh, once you're done testing module one, you say, okay, we have this module two that's a little bit higher on the hierarchy in terms of dependencies. Module two needs module one, but I've already tested module one. So for the purpose of this other set of tests, Module one becomes the collaborator, and module two becomes the system under test. Okay, so this particular test is going to start module one, but it's going to make assertions, uh, typically about about module two. So, um, and then you keep going like this, essentially uh, assembling your test from bottom uh, up all the way. The last thing you test is the main function that uses all of these modules that you've already tested. So you're moving from integration level tests all the way maybe from, I'm sorry, from unit tests to functional tests, uh, integration tests. So what do you think may be the drawback of this methodology? Raise your hand in back here. Yes. No. Okay. Uh, um, I would say like if you change one of the lower level modules, then you have to retest all the ones that are in that module. You, you have the right idea, but the way you formulated it is, is uh, I, I don't quite agree. So what he said was, if you change a lower level module, you have to retest everything that depends on it. Well, that's a fact. You cannot avoid it. Because if you change a part of your code that the rest of it, everything that depends on it, you have to test. The question is, how do you test that efficiently? But you do have the, 
Um, so you're saying if you change the one of the high um, high level modules, then and if it's not working, you're not sure whether the bug is in the module or in the collaborators. Yes, actually, I, I like this. So, um, but let's let's not phrase it in terms of what how you're maintaining and changing your project. Let's just phrase it on. You have a bunch of tests. You've written tests for independent modules, then the level one modules, depending on the level you know, two, and so on. If this test fails, you're not sure whether the bug is in module two, or is actually in module one in a case that you had not tested when you tested module one by itself. Okay? So that's one problem, uh, indeed. The other problem is that if you do manage to inject the bug in module one to some, uh, to some change, a, a lot of tests will fail. So the test for module one will fail, and the test for all of the modules that depend, okay? Is this a big problem or not? So if you, uh, if you have these dependencies, uh, <coughs> you have two sets of tests, module one test and module two plus module one test. If you, if you have a bug, if you inject a bug in module one, now both sets of tests will start to fail. So you get a lot of failures from one small change. Is this a disaster? Well, it's a common sense question. It's not a uh, hard math. I mean, I guess it's not as efficient because the test you wrote for module two are kind of useless at that point. It depends on module one, but I don't think it's a complete disaster. Yeah, I agree with you. So you get a lot of noise, but as long as you keep in mind that these are smaller tests, you go attack those, fix those, and then on. So I, I don't particularly think this is a big problem, but the one that I actually don't like uh, quite, um, I dislike quite a lot, is that tests become heavier and heavier, okay? Uh, to the point where the tests for these high level modules kind of, they require a lot of these components. Uh, and, and these components may be slow, they may be like the, the git command, a separate process that needs to be fired up maybe on a different machine, on a different data center, you need to fetch you know, Google Maps APIs. So yeah, uh, you, you trust this dependent on component, but it's just slow, okay? So ideally, you would like to have, instead of just the two sets of tests, you'd like to have three sets of tests. You'd like to have module one test by itself. Module two tests by itself, as much as possible. And then an integration test to put them together. And you would like most bugs to surface in the, in the tests that run the module in isolation, but you do want to test them together uh, because you can have bugs in the interaction between modules that may not be caught by low level tests. However, the bulk of your testing should be in the independent tests. Um, furthermore, I mean, it's a lot easier to induce a corner case in module two if you control just module two by itself if you have enough controls on it. As opposed to putting together a big system and tickling it from the edges, hoping to get some, uh, some inner component into a strange state, okay? So really, the bulk of your testing should be done with tests that are small as possible, but you should have a few tests that just you know, put things together to make sure they kind of uh, talk. So the question is, how do you actually write the test that runs module two without involving module one while module two actually is written to depend on module one. And that's when we become, uh, we, we come to strategy three, which says, well, if you can't remove the, the, the collaborator, then double it. And uh, so essentially we're gonna replace the dependent on component with the test double. And a double, it's pretty much, you know, as you might imagine from, uh, from uh, acting, it's uh, a highly trained replacement vaguely resembling the actor. And uh, the key word here is vaguely. Uh, the idea is that uh, to the system under test, the double looks almost like the real component. It may not be as fast, it may not be as secure, it may not be as scalable, um, but functionally, it's good enough 
to, uh, to let this run. Do you mean mock? Mocks are kinds of doubles. They're, they're multiple kinds of doubles, okay? Test double is a generic name that includes mocks. And uh, so what we're gonna do next is uh, look at various kinds of uh, test doubles and look at code examples for how you would uh, use them. Okay, by the way, I should point out that this, uh, these doubles have an additional advantage. Sometimes uh, when you're depending on component is a big component that's being developed at the same time uh, as, as the system under test, you may not have it available. So imagine the front end and back end, okay? Uh, one way to test the front end is to have a mock back end and vice versa. One way to test the back end is to have a mock front end. It's a lot faster to, uh, to have a double for the front end, even using curl to send requests to your back end like we did uh, for testing without waiting for people to develop all the JavaScript and all the HTML, all the CSS, okay? So uh, this is another big advantage of doubles. There are three uh, classes of doubles that I want to cover in, this, uh, in the rest of this lecture. Uh, the simplest one are called test stubs. And uh, what they really do, they're mostly inert. They don't have logic. They just have some memory that uh, has some pre-programmed or perhaps slightly configurable inputs. And it just sits there. And whatever is being asked by the system under test to give some data, it just passes the data that was pre-programmed. Okay? So this is the simplest kind. Then we have uh, the mocks. Uh, the mocks do... Everything the stubs do in the sense that they hand the data that was kind of pre, uh, pre canned, canned uh, inputs, but it also, the mock is a little bit more active than the stub. It checks, it will not just reply blindly to any request. It, it checks that it's getting the request that's expected for this test. Okay? Imagine uh, in terms of Git, if Git is to be doubled, a, a stub for Git. No matter what you ask git, it's going to give you a log. Whether you call git init or git log. It's very simple. A mock for git will first check, okay, is this a, a log command with the proper parameters? Then it's going to give the output that it has been pre-programmed. Okay? But it's going to fail if you're calling the mock uh, with a different kind of command. So the mock, in some way, it's a tighter check on your test. Uh, it will fail the test if you are interacting with it improperly. So in some way, it checks both the output from your system under test, that's the command to git, and it gives you the input, which is the output. Is that clear? Yeah. So when you say output, you mean the output of outputs that are like actually inputs to the system? Yeah, the outputs that are really input. Uh, that's what I mean. So I have them written here. So if this is the system under test, we're going to define input and output with regards to this system under test. So this is an input, obviously, but this is another input to the system under test, and it's the output of the double, and vice versa. The output of the system under test is the end result, but it's also everything it's sending uh, to the previous collaborators. And technically, you should check these, not just these. In traditional testing, you prepare the input, pass it in, and you make an assertion on the output. So technically, you should be checking that it's it behaving properly with respect to the outputs. Other questions? Okay, thank you for this question. And then there's one uh, one more kind of, uh, of test double, which is really a catch-all. Um, this is the most complex doubles. Well, it's a fake implementation. It's an alternative implementation. Um, for example, um, in, in one of my projects that uses a database, but it uses the database in a, in a fairly uh, simplistic way, not very complex queries. I wrote an in-memory hash table that plays the role of database. So as a hash table, you can store stuff, you can look it up by keys. It's a completely fake. I could never uh, use it in production. It's extremely fast. It's a little hash table in memory, okay? Uh, and I, we'll, we'll have some more examples of fake after. So, um, so I use all three of these, and uh, what I want to show you is uh, go into some examples for, for test stubs. You'll see that it's actually a fairly, fairly easy concept. Um, then for mocks, we're going to uh, use, we're going to look at some frameworks. So for mocks, people build libraries that help you build mocks. 
And then for fakes, again, this is where you actually have to write the, these fakes. They, they don't come um, from somewhere else. And we'll look at that quickly. Okay. So back to our um, get a bugger time example. So the function, the function that we want to test, let's say, is uh, get git log. It's the one that interacts with git. And I, uh, I wrote it such that it doesn't call git directly, but it receives as an argument an object that knows how to talk to git. Um, so for example, this doc, and I call it doc git to kind of hint that this is a collaborator. So uh, get git log, what it does, it invokes the command cmd uh, method of the git and passes the, the log uh, parameter and then it gets the log and, and does the rest of the work. Okay, so this is the system under test. Uh, and this is perhaps some implementation of, uh, of the git collaborator. Uh, the command, it actually does a, you know, starts the git process and passes it arguments and, and catches, catches the output. So this really interacts with the operating system here. And this is, uh, I've done this kind of separation to allow me to replace this. Okay, this is the expensive part. Uh, I want to test this part because I want to test that Mike would interact with it properly, and I don't want to use the real Git. I want to use some fake um, Git. So this is how I write the, the test. Um, so I'm, all, all of my tests are going to use the, the unit test framework for, uh, from Python, where all the tests start with this kind of test uh, prefix. Okay. So the first thing I do, I uh, I construct a stub, a replacement for this. And I haven't shown you yet the code, but you'll see it soon. And then I call the system under test, passing it the stub. And then I verify that the response is, is correct. So this is the actual test, and uh, it needs a stub. And the stub may be as simple as, as this. No matter what command you call it, it's going to return this log value, which I, I obtained from, from running git on my terminal and copy and pasting the output right in here. Okay. So this is the simplest way to write the test. And this is this is what the stub does. It's very dumb. I mean, no matter how you call it, it's going to give you the log. Call it three times, it's going to give you the log, uh, which is fine for this particular test. But it becomes, I mean, you can imagine that for every test, you'll need a different different stub. So any, any questions about this, this piece of code? Okay. This is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, this four for the blocks here, I hope you can pick them straight. Uh, well, the next thing, the next, so this is how you'd write the first test. But immediately thereafter, you say, okay, I'm not gonna copy and paste all of this uh, code because it's so similar. I'm gonna make a configurable stub, which is a stub that's a little bit smarter uh, in the sense that you can pre-configure it what reply to get as opposed to having the reply hard-coded in the body of the stub. So this configurable stub has, has an implementation of the command method, but doesn't return a, a hard-coded string. It returns whatever string is stored in the reply uh, uh, field, and you also give it a set reply method. And the way it's gonna work is the test will construct one of these and will program it, will configure it to say, next time you get called, return this. <coughs> Okay? And then the stub will hand that when it's called, um, will return that. So now you can write the, the code almost the same as before, except that now the test itself configures the stub with the actual log you want to see, uh, you want to get. And this kind of refactoring allows you to write multiple tests that are similar, except they use different log values to test different corner cases, perhaps. Okay? Well, uh, you do this testing and then you realize, well, I, I now want to test the error cases because your code should work when you're invoking git uh, in an error situation, perhaps asking log in an empty branch and so on. So that's called a Taboteur uh, test stuff. This is a test stuff that can not only return a response, but it can throw an exception as well. Okay. Um, so very similar to, uh, what we had before. The command, based on this internal variable, decides whether to raise an exception or return the pre-programmed reply. 
and you can pre-program the reply and the exception, and you have two setters uh, for the test to use if they want to use a reply or if they want to use an exception. So now you can write this test. You create one of these tabs, and then you say, I'm, let's pretend that it's going to get an I.O. error. So you construct the I.O. error exception, something similar to what Git actually, the real Git may throw. And then you programmed it into the stub. And then you call your system on the test. And while this is going on, you know it's going to invoke the command method of the stub. And the command method will get here because it programmed an exception. And it's going to raise an exception. And you want to see that your system on the test behaves properly when the underlying collaborator throws an exception. Okay? And uh, so the theme here, if you, if you notice, is that you start with the simplest stub for your first test. And as you write more and more tests, you go back and uh, put some more time into cleaning up your test infrastructure to uh, allow these stubs to be configured to the various corner cases you might be needing. Okay. So this looks like uh, programming, really. I mean, they call it testing, but this is programming. Writing these uh, configurable stubs can become uh, quite uh, challenging and, and satisfying because you end up putting more and more logic, uh, more and more logic in here. Now, if we keep going this, this uh, path, so this kind of test that I wrote, what do you think the, the danger may be in terms of uh, our test coverage? <clears throat> right. So the test is, is faking this <coughs> I.O. error, but what if Git uh, throws some other error? Okay, which you haven't thought of, or it's perhaps an I.O. error with a slightly different form. Uh, so your test may diverge from reality if you're not, uh, if you're not careful. Okay? So what do you think is the solution to this? Yes, so indeed, you can write tests that uh, test your, uh, your double. Uh, what I actually do is um, I write, I, I, most of my tests are of this form with mocks, but then I write one or two tests that actually use the real command. And those are slow tests, and they don't try to test the corner cases, but they mostly test the... Um, the interaction to make sure that actually I'm passing the right command and calling the right uh, process. Um, and uh, I remain vulnerable to, to the fact that many of my corner cases are tested with marks while the real life may be different. But the moment when somebody reports a bug saying, look, Git, when you pass it this command, returns this exception, I'm in a position to take that, copy and paste that, and create one more test. Okay? So this is important to realize. The goal of testing is not necessarily to get 100% best coverage because they're not there. Okay? But there's a lot of value in having this coded up because when the next bug comes up, it's very cheap to add another test. And this way, you pay as you go for tests. If you didn't have this, right, this program like this, let's say when you first develop GitHub, you've manually forced Git to throw a disk out of space error somehow, okay? And you tested that the code worked correctly, okay? Uh, later on, when you do maintenance, and some of the reports in other corner cases, you're not going to sit there and start to redo all those manual things. And you're not going to want to start adding tests later on because now you're on maintenance mode. Now you're working on another project. So... Uh, that's why you have to you have to invest in tests, and it helps you while you develop the code, and it's going to help you greatly while you maintain. And the good thing is that you can start a project with just a core few engineers who believe in test-driven development.
and you put all this in place, and then everybody will follow. Because it's easy to create one more test. It's hard to convince yourself to get started, except if you do it on day one when it's small. So. Okay, moving along. Um, so far, uh, we have done mostly state-based testing. And what I mean by this is, uh, again, with reference to the previous picture of inputs and outputs, we pass stuff into the, uh, into the system under test, and we've kind of prepared the collaborator to kind of give it uh, further inputs, and then we check the output. Okay? This is state-based in the sense that you set up the initial state, you start the code, you wait, as far as testing goes, you wait until it returns, and then you observe the, the return, or perhaps you go and look at what's in the database. Uh, so you inspect the state. Um, that's not the most powerful kind of testing you could do, uh, especially if you have uh, big tests. For example, some of my integration tests that use, uh, use Django uh, make many writes to the database to simulate a certain a scenario. And they produce some report at the end, some summary, some aggregation, uh, the sum or the average of some numbers. And if that's wrong, it's very hard to tell where in this long computation things started to go bad. So that's why uh, people have proposed behavior-based testing, which I'm going to do next. The idea in behavior-based uh, testing is that you don't just check the output of your system under test but you check actively all of the interactions of your system under test with the outside world. Uh, in particular, for example, writes to the database. Okay? And the moment uh, those writes to the database diverge from what you actually expect, uh, it gives you a much higher <coughs> chance of narrowing down the cause of the bug or the failure. Um, okay, so let's take a break now. Okay. Okay, so this, this brings me to mocks. So the stubs, uh, you can pre-program to respond, and you can configure them to respond differently in different tests, but pretty much they're very dumb. Uh, it, it's a one-way communication, the stub. The stub doesn't check that it's being called correctly. It just hands back uh, no matter what you ask. And it's very easy to build. Uh, mocks are intended to, uh, to be a double that uh, observes the indirect outputs of the system under test, which are the inputs to the mock. So observes how it's being called. And then if, the, if, if they're being called the way they expect, then they respond to some uh, pre-programmed uh, response. OK? Uh, so this is actually quite, uh, quite important. Imagine, uh, again, back, going back to the Git example, you don't just care what Git gives back to the parser. You care how the parser invokes Git. Maybe you need, uh, you need to check that there's three invocations of Git. The first is a Git log, then a Git uh, checkout, something like that. So you want to check to see the behavior during the test, not just the value at the end of the test. Okay. So in some way, this checks how the SUT behaves dynamically, not just what it computes at the end. Uh, for this part, I could do it in two ways. I could uh, teach the concept to you, uh, pretty much like we've done before, uh, to some handmade mocks. And even so, stubs you've seen, they're so trivial that you can just sit down and program them, just uh, 10, 20 lines of code. Mocks are a little bit more involved because they don't just hand responses. They have to remember how they were called and compare this with the expectation, but even then, they would be uh, pretty easy. However, for mocks, people have built frameworks, and I wanted to introduce uh, a, a couple of these frameworks to you. And there are two kinds of uh, frameworks that I want to cover. One, uh, it's a recourse replay style, and one is fluent uh, domain-specific languages. Generally, fluent in software engineering means um, this style of frameworks uh, they take advantage of languages like Ruby, perhaps, that have flexible syntax or domain specific languages to allow you to write almost in English uh, what they're trying to test. Okay, so we're going to see some examples. If you use Cucumber, Cucumber is a fluent uh, behavioral driven uh, development language. So, uh, pretty much for every language, you find a few candidates, uh, libraries in each category. 
So I'm going to write my examples in Python because they're uh, denser than, than Java. And I'm going to use pmock and mocks as, uh, as my examples. But pretty much the same thing you can find in, in Java and, and Ruby as well. So re first, the uh, uh, record replay interface. The idea is actually pretty cute. Is uh, instead of pre-programming the mock to expect to be called in a certain way, you create the mock and you have it in a special record mode where it doesn't do anything, it just remembers how it's called. And then you start calling it from the test. You make one, two, three calls, and the mock is gonna remember exactly how it was called. And you take this opportunity from the test to say, if I call you like this, you give this response. So you pre-program in the mock in one go, both the sequence of calls you should expect and the response you should give. So this is called the record mode of the mock. And then you flip a switch into the mock say now I'm gonna give you to the system under test and you behave exactly how we practiced before and uh, so the the mock switches to replay mode and uh, then it's called by the system under test and verify that it's called in the same sequence and it's gonna give back the same the same answer so it's it's a pretty cute uh, idea which is implemented in this library called mocks in uh, in Python so Let's write uh, one of these mock-based tests in record replay mode. So first, uh, mo the mocks library has the generic method to create a, a mock object for the git class. Okay, this mock object, uh, from the outside, you can call pretty much any method on it because it's in record mode right now. And it's gonna remember uh, how you call it. And then it's gonna behave the same way in, uh, so essentially you train it and then you use it. So immediately after creation, it's in record mode and you start calling it directly from the test. You call the mock object, you call the CMD entry point with this command line and you say, uh, and return this log value. So what the test does, it, it's programming, the mock say, uh, what I, you should expect a call to this CMD method with this argument. The mock at that point, taking advantage of Python and Ruby has similar kind of uh, reflection mechanism, it's gonna create a command method for itself to be used later. And uh, it's gonna have an assertion that the first call should be with this argument. And uh, you do a bunch of these for the sequence of calls and then you, uh, you switch all the mocks to replay mode. So well, I want to point out one thing. You could be creating multiple mock objects in this preamble of your test because you may have multiple collaborators. Here we only have one, okay? So you use mock objects of different classes, even create multiple mock objects for a specific class if that's what your system under test needs. So mocks replay all takes all the mock objects you've created because it keeps a list of them and switches them all to, uh, to replay mode. So from now on, the mock objects are not in learning mode, not in recording mode anymore. They only will accept these particular calls with this particular argument. Otherwise, they'll just uh, throw up. Okay, and now you call your system under test and you pass the mock object, and the system under test goes, does its stuff, and calls mgit.cmd. Uh, and mgit.cmd will verify that it's called with the proper method that it was pre programmed, and it's going to hand back this uh, pre programmed uh, value. And it keeps going like this. And then you do your state-based verification as usual. You check that the output of your system under test has the particular uh, value that you need. But you're doing one more thing. And this is what something you have to do at the end of uh, uh, these tests. Uh, you have to, actually this is a, there's a bug here. This should be mocks without verify all. You tell mocks, that you're done testing, there's gonna be no more calls to your marks, so now it's time to go and cross-check that the marks have been called exactly as, as programmed. Do you understand this, the flow? Okay, record replay, any questions? Can you explain the root mode of your code, how you actually create that request? So the, initially when it's created, it's, a, it's an inert, object that has no method, no field, no nothing. All it has is an ability to record how you're calling it. Uh, in Python and in Ruby, 
You can call this method CMD on an inert object if you pre-program it. It will accept the call and will uh, it's programmed to remember the call, the CMD lock method. So it builds a table internally, essentially, saying first I need the call to the CMD method with this argument, and I'm going to give this response back. So it's like teaching it. Okay, and then the actual calls will happen here. When you, when you pass it to the system on the test, the system on the test will call it, and it's going to verify that it's being called the way it was trained. Yes? Um, the parameter for the first one is the root? This one? Yeah, I don't understand. It's a name of a class. Essentially say, give me a, something that impersonates an instance of this class. And the method, the method that you're calling is the root? Sorry, I didn't understand this. Like, you only can call the method Yeah, this one. Oh, okay. I'm, but the way you tell it what to expect is by just calling it. Okay? And it's not going to do anything. These don't return anything. They just record how it was called. And then it's going to be called again, the CMD method of NGIT will be called again here. But this time it's in replay mode and will only accept to be called with the proper argument. Otherwise, it will abort it. Yeah. And then you're like saying what? Yes, yes. In one go, not only do you program how it's going to be called, but you tell it what it should return when it's called like this. So th this is like our stuff from before. Our stuffs were having this part, like we were programming them how to reply. But this one is programmed to check how it's called as well. Okay? Now, I have a question for you. Why do you need this verify all? Can't the mark abort the test when it's called, if the, if the call is not proper, why do you need a verify all in this case? Maybe you can print a summary of what happened. Say it again? Maybe just printing a summary of like everything together? That's not what it's doing. It's actually meant to fail the test if the calls are not uh, done <coughs> properly. Well, that's my comment here. Oh. Um, just think about, so if you don't um, understand the answer to this question, then it means you haven't fully understood how, how things work. So just think what can, could go wrong. Uh, uh, do you have a clarification question about the answer? Uh, I just had a thought question. Well, let's wait a little bit. Yeah, so the question is, why is this even necessary, this verify all? Because the marks know how they should be called. So whenever get git log calls them, if it calls a different method, not cmd, but init, it's going to abort here. Um, if it calls cmd with a different argument, not this, it's going to abort. Why do you need to, at the end, verify again? Specifically, what are you verifying? The, the, the way you write tests is if the test got to the end, it was correct. Yeah. But the test fails by an assertion somewhere in the middle. So if the mock is called with improper method or improper argument, then an assertion is going to come out from somewhere here. Because this calls the mock. The mock knows how it should be called. The mock complains. An exception gets called. So the test doesn't even get to this assertion. Why don't we leave this for a homework exercise? Uh, this way, I'm, I'll, I'll make sure everybody thinks about this. Let's move on. Uh, seriously, it's something you could do. Um, <clears throat> so, what kind of errors can come out of these uh, of these mocks? So, the one we described so far is uh, if the SUT calls the wrong method or the 
correct method is the wrong argument, um, then the mock is gonna is gonna abort. It's gonna say, look, uh, I was waiting now for a call to CMD with the argument log, and instead I got this. So you're misusing me. Uh, let's abort the test. But the other failure mode is uh, the SUT. You have programmed five calls into the mock, and the SUT only calls four. And the first four were the proper method, the proper argument. It's just the SUT never called the fifth one. The mock was waiting there waiting to be called on the fifth one to complain if it's an incorrect call, never got called, okay? So then it's gonna, uh, it's gonna complain missing expected command, okay? Hint, it's the line to the previous slide, okay? I'll, I'll leave it for the homework. Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, let's keep going to show you what else can these mocks do. Um, if you look to the to the library, you can do more than just program a particular command and a return. You can have these three calls, and you say in any order. So this essentially tells the mock when you remember these, don't be picky about the order in which the SUT calls you because it may depend on the time of day, whatever. However, for the first, for this argument, give back this value and so on. But when you're replaying, uh, don't, don't abort if these come in a different order, as long as all three come, okay? Um, and then the rest is exactly the same as before. So you, the record mode uh, has more kind of language to build more flexibility into the, into the recording or, or comparatives. Instead of saying uh, here specifically how the command line should be, maybe part of the command line is the time of day or something. You don't want to put that in the test. But you're saying as long as the, the argument contains the string short stat, then reply with this value and be happy. Okay? So you're relaxing uh, now the mock. Or you say, there's going to be a call to command, but don't care. Don't worry about the argument. Uh, whatever the argument is, um, return this. So this is kind of degenerating the mock into a stub, like we had before. Because stubs essentially are all like this. They don't care. In fact, stubs are even worse. Um, no, actually, stubs are like this. For this method, they care what method you're called, but they don't care how they're called. And as you may imagine, you need this flexibility because at some point you discover that your test is too tight. I mean, your mock is so picky that it becomes hard, hard to use. So you make the mock a little bit uh, more forgiving. But when you do this, you lose, you lose ability to find bugs because maybe there's a bug hiding in, in this argument here. Uh, you can have more complicated stuff, like you can have a conditional, uh, as long as the command argument contains dash p and log, be happy, and so on. You should really read the manual, but pick one of these frameworks uh, if you choose to, and look at the manuals, so you're gonna find a lot of these uh, goodies. And then the rest is the same. Okay, so that's what I wanted to uh, talk about uh, record and play. Uh, let's talk about fluent mocking frameworks. The idea here is somewhat similar, the difference is how you train the mock. That's the only difference. Uh, so you create the mock as before. However, next, instead of uh, calling the mock with the methods that it should remember, you have more direct uh, API to set expectations on the mock. Uh, however, the expectations often read as specifications, almost like English, natural language. And then you, uh, you exercise the, the SUT. So I'm going to show you a PMARC uh, here, but there's similar ones for Ruby and Java. So you create the mock, and then you start writing things like this. mgit expects once to be called on CMD with this argument will return value log value. Okay? So there's an attempt here to kind of use the, define the right methods such and the right <coughs> syntax to make it almost look like English. Okay. Ruby is, is a lot uh, better for this purpose because it's a language that's more forgiving in syntax. It doesn't force you to have parentheses. 
Okay, if you take the parentheses, it starts to suddenly look a lot more like natural language. Um, okay? And then you exercise it, and when you exercise it, uh, it will verify that it's called once with this argument, and we'll return that value. And so on. And you also have this kind of verify uh, that we had that we had before for the same purposes. And any question? Um, and then, you, uh, finally, the other thing you can do in terms of expectations is to, to add more intelligence into this mark. Say, okay, don't always reply with this value, but uh, you can build kind of a state machine almost uh, if your mark has a notion of, of kind of state. So this is in Java. This is an example from JBob. Um, so it says... Uh, Git gets one uh, one command with argument log, and uh, if it's already in the init state, then return this value and move to the state after log. And then it should get at least three uh, calls to CMD with particular kind of uh, conditions or arguments. When the conditions after log, we return this value and moves to init. So here you are programming a mark that kind of uh, first time it does something, then it gets three calls and moves back to the state, to another state. And uh, so the state machine kind of gives you fine control over the uh, order of the calls. And this kind of is meant to read almost like uh, like natural language. I have to say that personally, I don't find these uh, these very useful uh, for for two reasons. One. Uh, at some point, instead of using a pre-made state machine language that may or may not apply to my uh, to my project, I te typically prefer to implement this by myself for my project, <coughs> specifically using the terminology that makes sense for my mock, because it's not that complicated. Okay, so essentially what I'm saying is that uh, if I need mocks that are smarter and smarter, at some point I give up using on a framework, and I sit down and actually program this smarter mock myself. Because it's a lot cleaner, typically, uh, if I write the code for this that's very specific to, uh, to, to my project, as opposed to using a library that was built to be generally uh, useful by others. Okay. So that actually transitions me into, into fake objects. Yes? So what are there's pros and cons to the code of the they, they seem very similar. Uh, I, so personally, uh, I like kind of a combination of, of both. I wanted to show you this because it seems to be two kind of general uh, categories. I wouldn't say that there are pros and cons. Just pick one, become familiar with it, and use it. Uh, there's one more thing I want to see about. Uh, I want to say about all of this fluent language. Uh, I don't. I don't like this at all. Okay, personally. Um, in Java and Python, it doesn't even look very much like natural language because of all these parentheses and syntax is very constrained. In Ruby, it does look more like it. Um, but in Ruby goes even further, like this language called Cucumber that really takes this to an extreme. And uh, you have actually a domain-specific language in which you write these, and they really read like English. And it's cute when you see it the first time. So is this program uh, or English? Uh, and, uh, but it's only cute. Uh, the moment you start to actually use it uh, seriously, it's not a real program language. You cannot put breakpoints, you cannot put loops, you cannot, at some point it feels more uh, tiny. And the fact that I couldn't debug it, I couldn't put a breakpoint in it and have it stop there, because you can't put a breakpoint in an English sentence, uh, <laughs> that kind of did it for me. Anyway, uh, but uh, it's very commonly used in, in Ruby and Rails world, uh, Cucumber. <laughs> Okay, so fake objects, I, I do this quite a bit. Um, in fact, I don't do very fancy mocks. I jump uh, straight to fake objects. This is really, you bite the bullet and you write an alternative implementation of a subsystem or a component uh, with just enough logic in there and smarts to make it, uh, make it usable for tests, okay? And uh, I, I do this when the, when the component, the collaborator is not yet available. 
or we do this when uh, when the collaboration is across a major interface of the system, right? Between two teams, the client and the server teams. Typically, we 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 build a fake client and a fake server. Okay, and we do much of the unit testing with fakes. And then we do some integration testing uh, across across components. When the dependent on component is too heavy, slow, shared. As I said, I, I implemented the mock you know, database for a hash table for one project. It worked beautifully. Um, and this is a significant investment. Okay, so I, um, I don't do many of these. I pick carefully the interfaces where you build fakes. Uh, and typically those fakes, you end up investing in them long term uh, and maintaining them. So let me give you an example of where I would be using uh, fakes. And, uh, Imagine that you have a system that needs to monitor the air temperature over time and trigger alerts. So the way you would design it architecturally, you have a main class that has an entry point where you start, and you have something that gets called on every second, let's say, by some timer. And this something is going to be um, uh, sending alerts when the temperature maybe goes over, over a limit. And it's going to get the temperature by using another component that's a temperature provider. Uh, which can get called on get temp and returns the temperature. Okay, and the final component is a time provider. Uh, so this one uh, can give you the current time, but most often the way it's used is uh, on start, main says start your timer, and uh, passes on this method, this callback, to be called on every second or every whatever time. So, so this is how it starts. You start here. You will create a time provider. You register with the time provider to be called uh, on every tick, every second. And every second, or whenever the logic says you go read the temperature, you can maintain your internal state, like pass temperature, threshold, whatever logic you have, and then you call the alerter. One of these okay. So um, why would you want to use fake objects for testing this, uh, this project? as opposed to just running it and asserting that it sends the alerts. Right, so depending on what your logic is for sending alerts, it may actually slowly build its state to send the alerts. So it may take a long time to run the test. Other reasons. Like what edge cases? Certain times, day change, or like you know, if you get midnight when the clock changes. So very, very good. I had once a project that was misbehaving whenever it changes from winter to summertime. Once a year. Yeah. And it was a pain to debug. Uh, if I could mark the time, I could simulate that automatically as opposed to waiting for the next watch. Um, <laughs> midnight, yes. Um, temperatures. I mean, how, are you going to run the test with an active temperature uh, in your room at your desk? And what if this is made for you know, nuclear reactors? Uh, you need a mark for the temperature. Okay, so when you use sensors like this, you need to have software mark for your test. You know, not every developer is going to have the sensors. So uh, let me stop here, and we'll pick it up from here next time to show you how easy, actually, it could be to write marks for all this. And actually, one more thing to mention is you don't want to send alerts uh, doing your automated tests. Okay? So you want to mark the alerts as well. So pretty much everything you have to mark, except the part that's tricky, is the logic for deciding when to send the alert. That's what you want to test. So let's stop here. And I'll give you five minutes to uh, fill in the uh, 